It is a privilege to be in the house of the Lord today, especially here in Omagi with you wonderful people. Uh, we can feel that, that kindred spirit that people talk about. I mean, you step into a place where people do believe the truth and are filled with the spirit and they're just a family connection. So it's so wonderful to be here. We've been made at home uh, by your pastor and his wife. Great to meet them. Looking forward to getting better acquainted. But uh, by you as well, because you know what? We can just feel your kindness. And uh, this music today was fantastic. I mean, piano, drums, this, this worship leader of yours. Whew, took me to heavenly places today. And I, <laughs> that made me feel at home among you today. Amen. It is wonderful to have my wife here as well, dear Paula Ann. We've been married 40 years. She's put up with me all that time. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say she's always happily put up with me all that time, but she's put up with me all that time. 40 years now. And that's also how long that I've been in the ministry. Goes all the back, way back to when we first got married. Uh, and I am telling you, God is a great God who does great things. We've had an interesting journey. Uh, right after we graduated Bible college, we went to Japan and were missionaries for seven years. Our son was born there. And in fact, while we were on deputation, we were in Omagi. This would have been about 86 or 87 for a church service. But I'm going to tell you what, I've lived a lot of years since then, and I've pretty much forgotten everything <laughs> about our visit, other than it was with the people of God and in this community. But uh, it's good to be back here now, all these many years later. And uh, we've pastored in Tulsa since 1991. So we pastored there a little over 30 years and we just felt the Lord leading us in a different direction. And uh, we're so excited about this part of the journey. Uh, it, the Lord is wonderful and he makes things new every morning uh, to us. He is a good God. How many love the Lord today? I appreciate what Pastor said about the truth. The word of the Lord has the power to change our lives. It's the only thing that truly can change us in our humanity and make us something that's better. And I'm thankful that uh, his spirit is at work among you today. Now, I just want to encourage you to keep your hearts open to the Lord. I'm going to do a little of what my, my pastor used to call treaching. And it's kind of a mix between preaching and teaching, treaching. And uh, I want to share with you some truths from the word of the Lord that he has laid on my heart. I've been praying for you all week, just asking God to make this a special time and a special place. Uh, with a special word from him for us. Now, I do want to tell you this right up front. It won't do you a bit of good unless you, unless you receive it into your life and you apply it to yourself. Uh, I can give you a check this morning for $100,000. Not going to do you any good until you apply it, you know, to the bank and have it cashed and uh, make it yours. Uh, this message, whatever God brings you anytime from the word, has to be personalized and applied and I'm going to encourage you to do that before you leave here today, all right? Okay, you ready to hear good things from above? Yes. All right, I do believe I have a word from the Lord. I'm going to Psalms in chapter 103 today, Psalms 103, uh, 1 through 4. I've been reading this chapter all week long. And I'm not going to preach you the whole chapter. Let's see, how many verses? 22 verses, nope. I'm not going to preach you 22 verses, but I am going to start with the first four, Okay. So if you're there with me today, Psalms 103, verse 1 through 4, say amen. amen. All right. The word of the Lord says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. How many already know that sounds familiar? Excellent. Verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Somebody say, all means all. All his benefits. Verse 3, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Come on, that means some of us have had those kind of escapes. Amen. Those kind of blessings. And who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. And today I want to preach on this message or preach on this message. Bless you. Bless you. Let's bow our heads and let's just ask God to talk to us, right? In the name of the Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the power that it has. And I ask you to help me to help these people, to bless me that I might bless them, God. And we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Without you, we can do nothing. In Jesus' name. And everybody loves God, said amen. amen. And you may be seated. Thank you for standing uh, for the word of the Lord. Uh, bless you, bless you, bless you. It sounds like we're... We're responding to somebody sneezing, right? 
And of course, that was one of the first things that came to my mind when God began to give me this topic. I thought about how that people say that, you know, bless you or God bless you when someone sneezes. And it made me curious about how all that got started uh, so many years ago. Because I can remember, but you know, it's not quite so common today. A lot of times today, somebody sneezes and you go, oh boy. It's like, it's like an acknowledgement of the shocking moment, right? As they sneeze and you, you almost feel like you have to say something in recognition of this event. Maybe, you know, maybe it was a colossal event that just took place. I know uh, not long ago we were sitting on the couch in our living room and, and I sneezed and it was extra forceful. <laughs> and Paula jumped about two inches on the couch and the dog gave me a dirty look and left the room. <laughs> And uh, he was offended. I think he was scared. But anyway, uh, I understand, you know, that, uh, that when people, uh, you know, sneeze or we say, bless you, um, it's an acknowledgement of that event. But as I was studying it out to decide or and understand why this, this phrase was started, it actually came out of the Dark Ages because uh, the church during the Dark Ages thought that if you sneezed, you opened yourself at that moment to evil spirits. So they would say, bless you. Someone would say, bless you, because they, they thought that person was in a susceptible moment where these evil spirits could enter into them. Well, I want to tell you, if, that's, if there's any truth to that, I want a whole lot of bless yous when I sneeze. Another one, though, that I found, in fact, I found there were several, but another interesting one that I found when people would say, bless you, is because they thought, again, kind of in the same time period, that your heart would stop when you sneezed. Now, I've sneezed so hard, I thought my heart maybe had skipped a beat, but they, they thought maybe your heart might stop and you might die. So if you survived, they would say, God bless you. Like, you know, thank God for keeping you alive or that you got another heartbeat or you got another breath after that sneeze. So I can understand, you know, back in that time of science and not understanding, you know, all of humanity and the body and all of that, that people might would think that. But then I read this other one. And it was within this particular culture that they believed when you sneezed, it was an omen for good. It, it meant that you were going to be blessed when you sneezed. It kind of makes you want to sneeze more if that's true, right? Uh, that you would be blessed when you sneeze. And so they thought that was, a good, of course, I've heard of other cultures who think that it's a blessing when a dog or, uh, or excuse me, not a dog, but a bird flies over your head and, and lets go on your head. I heard that could be a blessing too. I'm not interested in that at all. <laughs> but uh, so I don't know. Some cultures have these ideas about what a blessing might be. But they thought, well, if you sneezed, it was actually an omen of a blessing coming your way. So they would say, bless you. But I do know this, and that is that we live in a day and in a world where there is a huge need for blessings. Anybody got room in your life for a few more? I do, and I know how to get them. The Bible teaches me how to get my life in line so that the windows of heaven are open, that his blessings are pouring out. Uh, we have a phrase sometimes that we use around our house, I'm living under an open heaven. Amen. We do what we can to keep the heavenly window open in our lives because we are dependent upon the blessings of God. I've lived without them and I've lived with them and I can tell you which one is better. I do remember, you know, through the scripture that blessings are, are connected to how we live our life for God. And I do believe the world needs to have more blessings. And in fact, I believe that we have the potential to be a blesser. In fact, I think we have a calling to be a blesser. And this world is in such short supply. But even though we have, all of us have this ability, I think many people today are unmotivated when it comes to blessing one another. But it doesn't seem like they're so unmotivated when it comes to cursing one another, right? I mean, that's something there's plenty of that goes around. I mean, just people cursing is, is when somebody is just expressing the displeasure or maybe they're angry, upset. But, it, but sometimes nowadays it's just cursing is just a, a part of vocabulary and conversations. And it, it seems so worse than when I was a kid. How many, how many know what I'm talking about today? And I mean, there's plenty of cursing going around. You get in a traffic jam or something happens and, and people, are, you, you don't, you, maybe you don't hear them and what they're saying, but you're reading the look on their face and you can read lips a little bit and maybe hand gestures and know that, you know, they are not happy with you. And you are definitely not being blessed in the moment. 
I remember years ago, my wife was dropping our son off at uh, school one morning, and there was a lady, when, when Paula pulled in, she was pulling out, and, uh, and she got so angry with my wife for pulling uh, in front of her to pull in. And, uh, and, and she began to give Paula this evil look on her face. And she was just, you know, and she was mumbling stuff and you knew it wasn't good. And Paula just perked up and smiled real big. And, and all of a sudden that lady, she got a look of confusion upon her face. And, and it was like, and she smiles and waves back. I'm telling you, that's what happens. That you can, by blessing others, turn their curse into a blessing in your life. Amen. This is a powerful scriptural principle. The Bible says that the power of death and life are in this tongue. And that with our words, we can either bless or curse. We get to make up our mind which we're going to do. We can all grumble, complain, talk bad about people and talk bad about things, or we can speak forth positive, life-giving words, words uh, from the word of the Lord that will breathe life into others. And you know what? Life into ourselves. Cursing often, I, as I said, it's just somebody that is expressing something in their frustration, their anger or their excitement. You know what? I, I heard something years ago. It said that hurting people hurt people. Think about that just a minute. Hurting people hurt people. Think about this the next time somebody lashes out at you. Think about this the next time somebody is unkind, says unkind things. And ask yourself the question, what are they going through? What are they experiencing in their life that would cause them to be this caustic, to be this upset, to have these emotions of anger coming out where it, it doesn't make sense even that they're coming in your direction. But hurting people hurt people. Hurting people hurt people. How many know God loves all the hurting people? In fact, I have to tell you today, God loves not just the hurting people, He loves all the people, even those that are the cursors among us. He loves them. And... Uh, I realize it's just a normal part of, of American vocabulary today to, to hear all of these curses, but uh, there, there is a righteous way to respond. And that's what we need to look for because it leads to a path of righteousness. Uh, I, I was thinking about a phrase. Now, my daughter-in-law, she's from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, way down south. I used to think Oklahoma was south, then I married... Uh, a wife from the north, she's my Yankee wife, from Toledo, Ohio, and uh, found out that they consider us southern down here in Oklahoma. We're not really southern, we're kind of southwestern, right? I mean, I think of southern, I think of people in Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. Well, now I have one in my family. And uh, one of her favorite phrases is she'll say, bless your heart. But you know what? It doesn't mean what you think it means. I'm not saying that somebody can't say that and it actually be, you know, a, a words of kindness. But uh, sometimes it means that, you know, you're just being a little bit crazy right now. And just bless your heart for your, for your, uh, your disappointing behavior. Uh, but the Bible does call on us to be blessers. And I found, I found this, and maybe your pastor has as well that being a blessing leads to receiving a blessing. Live the blessed life and you will see blessings coming your way. Now, many people I know when it comes to being a blesser, remember I'm talking about bless you. Uh, when it comes to being a blesser, I know there are many people that think, well, that's God's business. God is in the blessing business. That's not really my business. It's his business. After all, he is the great blesser. And that is so true. However, it doesn't exempt us, you and me, from the bless you life. Bible tells us in Matthew 5 and 44, it says, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. We've already talked about that, right? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. See, even when they are against us, we should be for them in Jesus' name. Amen. We should be an encouragement to them. One of the things I try to do when I find myself in a line at Walmart is I, I try to see if I can make the cashier smile before I walk away. Hey, their job is not always a pleasant one, 
They deal with a lot of difficult personalities. But when I walk away, I want to know that they have been lifted in some way. That their day has gotten better because they've come in contact with an apostolic believer. Amen. I want to leave a blessing behind me, not just another frown, not just another complaint, not just another uh, mark on their dirty list waiting for time to get off. I want to be that ray of sunshine in their day. Now, I can, I can tell you, I'm not always uh, effective in getting that uh, done. But I go with the idea that I want to be a blessing. And I think that's the way we ought to live. Even when others are against us, we should be for them. Did you know Jesus prayed on the cross? He said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Sometimes people don't understand how, how their upset moments and their lashing words, how, how it's really, really affecting them and dampering their life and hindering their life and, and casting a great shadow over their life. The more they do it, the more gloomy it gets. They do it for years and years and years. And there's this person that walks around with this big dark cloud hanging over them all the time. The gloomier it gets, the more they do it. But Jesus told us that we should pray and ask God, forgive them, even if they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand the consequences of it. He also taught us this, and it's very powerful. It's that the blessings would come to our life from others. He was talking about uh, giving. He says, given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. How many like to get or receive in that way? Give and you shall receive in this heaped up, running over method. But it goes on and it said, for he said, men will give into your bosom. It says, men are going to give to your bosom. How am I going to get blessed? God often used somebody like Pastor Clark to be my blessing. Sometimes he's going to use you to be one another's blessing. Sometimes he's going to use the little kid among us to speak something and say something that is going to be our blessing. Sometimes it's going to be the guy down at Casey's and you're not even going to be aware of it, but you're, you're in there and something happens that, that this person that may not even admit Christ in their life will end up being his instrument to bring blessing to your life. Be careful about getting too frustrated in your employment because God will often use your place of employment to be the man that blesses into your bosom of your life. Those blessings come that way. And if you want the blessings, the Bible tells us that uh, this is words of Christ again. He says that uh, the key to receiving it is it is more blessed to give than receive. So I'm talking about the bless you life. And if you want more blessings, he said, be the blesser, be the blessing that you would like to receive. Show forth the blessing. Bless you. Bless you. And I think it's very important that when we live this life, as Christians, when we walk away, are people glad to see us leave or are they glad to see us leave the room or walk into the room? If you're not a blesser, they're glad when you leave the room. But if you bring blessings with you, they're going to always be glad when you show up because you show up and, and you are, have a bless you life that leaves blessings in your wake. The Jewish culture has pretty much a blessing for everything. It's just instilled in their culture going back uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of years. Uh, when they meet, when they eat, when they, uh, when they pray, when they say goodbye, they have a blessing. How many have ever heard the word shalom? Basically means peace be unto you, peace to you. Uh, shalom is something they say when they meet you. And then they have the conversation, and when they leave you, they say it again. Peace be unto you. Because they're, they're coming with a blessing of peace, and they're leaving with a blessing of peace. It's a very, very common phrase. But there's also another one that's very common, and it's called barakata in Hebrew. Barakata really just means bless you. Barakata just means bless you. And many times in their relationships, when they meet somebody, they'll say, Barakata, bless you, and then talk about, I almost was in a wreck the other day. There was a chariot that ran me over. They'll go on with their conversation, but before they, they enter into the conversation, they'll say, bless you first. And it's not just a blessing towards you, but it's a blessing toward God. They're hoping that conversation will somehow uh, honor God and it will be an encouragement and help to you. 
And so they started with this barakata. And, uh, and it's interesting that many times they attach to it, the you that they attach to it, bless you, maybe bless you, Brother Clark, but it often is a bless you, Adonai, or Lord. Bless you, Elohim, which is God, or bless you, Yahweh, which is Jehovah. And so they'll enter into these conversations or prayers and they'll start it with a bless you. What I'm really saying here is that we don't only have a responsibility to bless one another, as I've already stated, but we have a great responsibility to be a blessing to God. And you say, how can I be a blessing to the Lord? How can I bless God who is the blesser of all? How can I give God who doesn't need anything something that would bless him? But I am telling you, David understood that not only God was his blesser, but that he had a responsibility to offer blessings back to the Lord. And we read it in our text. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord. It's almost like he's declaring it, that this is something I've got to do. Soul, you don't have a choice about this. You're going to do this. I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord. He was commanding of himself that this is going to be my relationship with God. That God isn't just this, this God I go to to supply all of my needs. He's not just this being that I look to for deliverance and salvation. But he is the God who blesses every point of my day. And therefore, I am going to live the bless you life. Barakata Adonai Elohinu. Barakata, bless you, God. And he goes on, he talks about it. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. The word benefits here means the miracles of kindness. I am telling you, nobody's as good to you as God is good to you. He is the origination of the word good. That God is a good God and all good things come from above out of his hand. Amen. He's the creator of them all. Praise God. This is the wonderful God, the miraculous God of blessings that are being imparted into our life. And David spends the whole chapter of Psalms 103 just talking about all these wonderful kindness, miraculous kindness of God. In verse 3 and 4, we read this. He said, who forgiveth all thine iniquities. I had, a, I had an elder pastor friend, and he, he would, uh, he'd, anytime he read all, he'd say, and all means all. I did that today. Copied him. All means all, meaning it's inclusive. It's not just some of this and some of that. All means all. And the scripture said, he forgiveth all thine iniquities. So, well, you know, I've done so bad or I've been so bad and God could never forgive me for this. And I'm saying all means all. Say, well, I just keep doing the same thing over and over and I fail and I fail. And, and it's like, you know, I want to do good, but I just keep doing the wrong that I don't want to do. And, and, and God's surely fed up with me by now. And I'm telling you, his mercies are renewed every morning and they endureth forever. The truth of the word declares. His mercies endure forever. I am telling you, my God does not give up on giving you and I second chances. Amen. Who forgiveth all our iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Pastor talked about how that I went through a rough patch physically when COVID first came out. I was put into a drug-induced coma for 30 days and put on a vent. And, uh, and there were times that my poor wife didn't know if I was going to be coming home or not. It was so early in the whole COVID thing. There'd been, I was in the hospital the first day or the, the day the first person in Oklahoma passed away. I was waiting, waiting my turn for something. And the next day they put me on a vent and knocked me out. And they didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but I'm telling you it was miraculous. Uh, when, when I finally came to, the doctors and the nurses were standing around clapping their hands and celebrating because they didn't know if people were going to survive this at all. And, uh, it, and it was just wonderful and miraculous. Uh, my, my doctor eventually, he was interviewed by the newspaper, and he said, yeah, he said, that man, he said he, he responded to rebound like an 18-year-old. Believe me, I was an 18-year-old. But that's what God does. He says he, he's there to deliver and bless and work, you know, in dealing with all of your diseases. You got something? You know somebody that's got something? 
It's within the ability and power of God to do something about that something. That's just how he is. All thy disease, oh, well, it doesn't mean all means all means all. Quit trying to rewrite the word of the Lord. All means all. All thy diseases. Listen to this. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Man, sometimes we, we mess up our life so bad. Paul and I worked at the Tulsa County Jail for five years teaching people about uh, alcohol chemical recovery and, and such and trying to help them get their life on track. And we met a lot of people with messed up lives. My God has the ability to redeem a life from the destructive path that they have been walking. He can, and many of them went on and they, they gave their life to God and many of them end up doing great things. In fact, we have a family member who was caught up with, uh, with drugs for, for some time, but yet today is, is involved in the kingdom of God, preaching the gospel. Why? Because God, he can deliver from all things, all destructive things. He redeems them. And then it goes on and said, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercy. <laughs> Amen. I, I've met people through the years. Now, you would have no testimony of this, but they would say, uh, you know, uh, Keith, you're, you're, you're so nice or you're kind. And uh, in fact, if they knew me when I was young, they say it with a very shocked voice. I can remember after I got the Holy Ghost, I was, uh, I was 20 years old when I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I went back to work the next day and the guy I worked with, he said, what's wrong with you? And I said, what do you mean? He said, you're being nice. <laughs> I didn't know it was so bad. But evidently I was caustic. And, and so, but that's the power of the Holy Ghost to change your life. We become a new creation in Christ. Amen. And so when, when that takes place, it's just God changing our life, miraculously altering our life by the power of his spirit. And uh, you could have been the, the roughest, raunchiest, reckless, you know, whatever characteristic that is, is maybe profane and ungodly. But my God can turn you into the sweetest, kindest, most loving, respectful, gentle spirit because he is the creator. Amen. Praise God. I, I think sometimes our spouses wish God would just get a hold of us a little bit, do a little more tweaking on all that. Help him, help him God, help him to be a little sweeter. He's just being a little too himself. Amen. How many know we all need to be perfected? Amen. Uh, what's interesting is the root he, of the Hebrew word bless. What does it mean to bless somebody? Well, that means you give them money. Hmm. Maybe, maybe not. Oh, I'm going to bless them. That means you give them a compliment. Boy, you look nice today. That's a blessing, a word of encouragement. Yeah, you know, that, that's nice. That's nice. But biblically, there's only one word that's used for bless in all of the Old Testament. And that particular word bless means to literally bow in adoration and offer thanksgiving. Barak or Barak or Baruch. That word means, in fact, our son's name is Barak. It means that you bow yourself in loving adoration, in praise and thanksgiving. It's one of, of what I know to be seven praise words of the Old Testament. So when you bless the you in your life, when you bless God, when you bless others, you know what you're offering to them? You're showing appreciation, love, and respect to them. Now, I, I can tell you I haven't had anyone ever just bow down at my feet and, and give me, you know, that Barack of praise. <laughs> but I have had a lot of people who loved me, who respected me, who showed appreciation. Don't you love it when other people treat you that way? You know what they're doing? They're living the bless you life. If they make you feel appreciated, make you feel loved, make you feel respected. And, and, and don't you love it when God makes you feel that way? You feel blessed when, he, when, when you feel appreciated by, and loved by God and, and, and respected and honored. And, and, but God feels the same way when we do it to him. When we do the bless you to him, when we bless the Lord, oh, our soul, 
It's about that. It's about, it's about appreciating God. It's about loving God. It's about honoring God in our life, respecting Him and showing Him respect. Say, how in the world can I bless a God who has everything? You can love Him. You can appreciate the goodness that he's brought into your life. All of the wonderful things he protects you from in your life. You can appreciate that. You can honor him as Lord and Master and Savior, the God of your life. When you honor the Lord, when you respect his word and you obey and follow his plan and purpose, when you do that, you're honoring God. And yes, you are blessing God. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Amen. You know, today in contemporary circles, we use the word soul kind of in a different way than it originally was meant. Um, we talk about the soul and we think about the soul of man is that piece of man that's going to live eternally. And, and, uh, and I understand that concept and I'm not disagreeing with that. But I'm telling you in old English, King James English, and even in, in biblical uh, uh, Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew, it really the concept of soul means life force or being. Bless the Lord, O my soul. David was saying, bless the Lord with all of my life. Uh, 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 let, me, let me give you another example. The Bible said to Abraham, not Abraham, get my Old Testament people mixed up, Adam. The Bible said Adam was formed from the dust of the ground. God breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living soul. The word soul means life. When the Titanic went down, it went down with how many souls? That's how they, they would say it in the old days, you know, because the soul represented the being. It represented the life force, the life of that individual or being. And the uh, Bible tells us that it's not the soul that goes back to God. It's, the Bible said it's the spirit. When we die, the spirit returns to him that gave it. Now, so I'm not trying to mess with your theology. If you want to still think of soul as the part that goes back to God, I don't think God cares. But I'm saying it for this purpose today because in the scripture when he said, bless the Lord, O my soul, he wasn't just talking about this little part in here that belongs to God, maybe something in the corner of my heart. He wasn't talking about that. When David said, bless the Lord, O my soul, he was saying, bless the Lord all my life. With all of my life, all my life is, all my life will be, all my life can become. Bless the Lord with everything, my talent, my goods, you know, uh, my resources. Bless the Lord with my life. Didn't Jesus even teach us this? He said, love the Lord with your everything, right? Love with the Lord with all of your strength, you know, all your heart, all your mind. Love God with your everything. That's the great commandment. And that's what David was doing here when he said, bless the Lord, O my heart. He was talking about how God was the you that he wanted to bless. God made, David made God the you of his life. And I want to bless my, my family, my kids, my grandkids. I got three real special ones. You want to see their picture? Come and talk to me after church. I, I love my grandkids. Uh, he's blessed me with, but you know what? He's ultimately the bless you of my life. Bless you, God. Bless you because without you, I wouldn't have them. Without you, I wouldn't have anything that really matters. Without you, I would be a mess. Without you, would I be out of jail? And would, would I be even living if it wasn't for you, God? What kind of mess would I would be in? I'm, prob I'm just telling you, in my own humanity, I'm capable of some pretty big messes. But because of him, Oh, I want to bless him with my life. If we live that bless you life, our focus will shift. It will change. We'll, we, you know what? We'll, if we really live a bless you life, God, then our focus is going to change from what we don't have to what we do have. From what is wrong in our life to what is right in our life. Remember the old song, Pastor? Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. How many know that old song? Oh, that's an old one. We show something about ourselves, sister, when we sing something like that. That's right out of the hymnal. Count your blessings. Well, you know, that concept, that came out of, out of a time in our country when people understood that without him, I'm nothing. And instead of counting my troubles, which, come on, folks, 
would you really want to live, be living 75 years ago, 100 years ago? And the hardships that they faced every day, just trying to get by and make a living. My grandparents ran a farm and they were as poor as poor could be, just fighting every day to have enough. I, I, I don't want to go back to those. I love air conditioning. I love air conditioning. I love being able to go to the grocery store and not have to grow it in my backyard, although I like fresh tomatoes. Yeah, I, I, I can tell you that was one of the many blessings when I pastored those people in the church that had gardens and would bring me a tithe out of their garden from their tomatoes. It was wonderful. Appreciated that much. I was blessed. Amen. But I am telling you that if you want the blessed life, you have to make sure that he is the you that receives your blessings. You'll, you'll find yourself that you can be complete in him. Say, well, there's just something missing. I'm just, there's just something that's, that I feel incomplete. There's something that I need. I've got an empty spot. <laughs> we had a neighbor. He was a British man and uh, he, he never had a pet or a dog growing up. And one day we were out in the cul-de-sac in front of the house and, uh, and he was out there and we were talking and we had this, this beautiful uh, cocker spaniel, just so mild tempered and sweetheart of a dog. And, and he was there and, and he was looking at Reggie and he was saying, oh, you know, she said, I never had a, a dog like this. She said, I have a dog sized hole in my life. <laughs> I thought that was so comical, a dog sized hole. I kind of saw it as like a puzzle and there was this piece of a puzzle that was shaped like a dog, uh, especially a Cocker Spaniel, shaped like a dog, and that piece was missing, and all the other pieces were there, but he had a dog-sized hole in his life. But it wasn't long after that I began to realize that, you know, no, 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 this is what people have all over the place today. They have a God-sized hole in their life. We are created with this place in our life, this throne room in our life that you can't put anything else on and find satisfaction and happiness. You can't sit there yourself. You can't be the Lord of your own life. It doesn't lead to happiness. It doesn't lead to anything that you are going to enjoy and appreciate. But many people do try to fill that, that God-sized hole with everything else, don't they? They try all kinds of substances and relationships, and if this one's not working, I kick them out and I get me another one, and they keep doing that year after year uh, because they're searching for that thing that is going to make the difference in their life. What they need to do is quit chasing the stuff. It's not found by more things or by a better job or more money, and uh, there has to be peace you find in the storm, not not just, I've got to get out of the storm. He is, he is the author of whatever storm you're going through. He is just as much God in the midst of your rough times as he is your good times. And I'm telling you today, if you find that there's a hole or empty spot in your life, that the answer is to quit chasing the other blessing because it's false, but start chasing the blesser. Start pursuing him. Begin to live the bless you life. Begin to bless God. It's, 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 it's saying, Lord, I want you to be the master of my life, the blessing of my life. And I'm going to close with this today. And that is, uh, years ago, we had an opportunity to go to New York Harbor, and we went out to Liberty Island. And there was that majestic lady, you know, the Statue of Liberty standing there. And uh, it, it was impressive. It was impressive, uh, the Colossus, that huge undertaking, that gift from France to us. Um, it, it's beautiful, but you know, the most beautiful thing to me were words that were inscribed on a plaque at the base of that, of that towering structure. And it says this, it says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, masses yearning to be free. How many have heard that before? Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses that are yearning to be free. It was an invitation to those that were in Europe to come to America to find opportunity. It did not promise them success. It just promised them an opportunity to pursue, to have the liberty to pursue. 
And it, it just reminded me of the words of Jesus Christ because he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And he said, And I will give you rest. See, the only way that that works is if we apply ourselves. It's an opportunity. That opportunity has been in, our, in, in writing for 2,000 years and available to mankind for 2,000 years. But not everybody that's lived in 2,000 years have taken advantage of the opportunity that we can come unto Him and find rest for our soul, which means rest for our life. We can find rest for our life. It, it, because, you know, we understand that His yoke is easy and His burden is light. And in it, we find rest. We find rest in Him. Come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's our opportunity today. We have an opportunity to change our life by changing our perspective in the presence. We have an opportunity today to change our future and our family's future by taking our mind off of all of the problems, the people we don't like and can't get along with, all the difficulties that we experience in life, all the struggles. Come on, that's life. That's humanity. As long as you're living, there's going to be things to contend with. But if you put your focus upon the one that has blessed you and begin to count those blessings, begin to realize the blessings. Like David, just command yourself in the morning, I could get up and go griping, or I could get up today and I could bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. I could bless His holy name. I could recount and bless Him for all of the wonderful works that He has done in my life. All the great things that He has done in my family. Uh, my wife was, was uh, the other day, she uh, had found something online and it was a picture that somebody had made, and it was all of these things that they owned. They took a picture of everything they owned, and then they made kind of a collage of all of these little bitty tiny pictures of representing all of the things they owned. And so Paula was sitting there on the couch, and she said, you know, she said, I I'm just going to, for a moment, she said, I'm going to just begin to count the things in this room. And she said she got to 100, and it was still going. Now, I know that's, if you've got a house with a lot of knickknacks in it, you're going to get there really quick. A uh, hundred, really quick. Go try it sometime. One room in your house and begin to count the things that are in there. The number of sweaters or shirts or, or whatever in your closet. The number of shoes in your closet. Begin to count the things that God has blessed you with. You're going to be shocked at how much accumulation you have that are the blessings of the Lord. We are a blessed people. Whether we recognize it or whether we respond to it, whether we offer God praise for it or not, we are a blessed people. And if you want to see blessings continue to flow in your life, I just want to encourage you. Keep your eye off of the other. Try to avoid the, the, the curse shoes of this life and instead enjoy the bless you. Get a bless you attitude and begin to treat others in that honorable, respectful, loving and kind way that God would treat us. Amen. If, if there's something missing, realize that the Bible says we are complete in Him. And if you are, are feeling incomplete today, it's, it's not because God can't complete you. It's not because He's lacking resources. It's because there are things that you haven't yet allowed Him to come in and to develop within your life. We are complete in Him. There are a lot of people that are in the church that are not yet in Him. The Bible said if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. It didn't say if any man's in the church, he's a new creation. We have to be in Christ and Christ in us. John 15 teaches us, abide in him and he abides in us. And we can ask what we will and it shall be done unto us. Amen. We'll have what he said was a fruitful life. Amen. When we get that kind of connection going with God. Amen. So thank him for all he's done and find completeness in him. Would you stand with me this morning? Oh, I'm so excited about the generosity of God. Paul and I entered this phase of our life, you know, when the Lord led us to resign from Life Tabernacle Tulsa. And we, did, we didn't know where we were going. We didn't know what we were going to do. We were entering such a time of change. I mean, for years and years, I knew what I was going to be doing with my life. But we, we knew the Lord was in this. And we had to put our trust in Him. Proverbs chapter 3, trust the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He'll direct your path. We had to start practicing what we preached, right, honey? 
And as we began to do that, you know what? He's opened wonderful doors for us. And he has shown us great things. And he's taken care of us uh, every step of the way. And uh, today we are so blessed to be where we are with God. I'm in Alton, uh, Mulgee, Oklahoma. I almost called you Muskogee. Alton, Mulgee, Oklahoma today. Never would have imagined this a couple of weeks ago. Meeting wonderful people, having a wonderful worship time with you. And uh, so, so thankful for this opportunity. And God knew it was getting ready to happen all along. Isn't he wonderful? Amen. So you are a blessing in my life. Bless you. Bless you. And bless the Lord who gave us one another. Could we respond to him right now? Would you lift your hands and your heart toward him? Dear Jesus, Lord, I ask you to fill every empty place in the hearts of man. Every empty spot in the soul of man, the life of man, God. Fill it with your goodness and mercy. You said your goodness and mercy would follow us all the days of our life. Let it be unto these, God. Let them, Lord, wherever they go, your goodness and mercy is on their heels, seeking to bless them and work in their life. God, when they find themselves in trying situations, let them feel that your peace and presence is there, giving them wisdom and giving them help in their time of need. When their bodies begin to, to retaliate, when their bodies begin to say, I am sick, Lord Jesus, let the Spirit, your unction, let, Lord, that divine power come and touch them and minister healing unto their bodies. Be our God in our times of need. The Bible says you're a present God in times of trouble. So I pray for these people to be abundantly blessed as they live the blessed life. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. No one should leave here today with an empty spot in your life or a hole in your life or a dog-sized or God-sized hole in your life. Amen. God bless you. Love you one and all.